I grew up in a family where I didn't quite belong and where my family wasn't quite sure what to make of me. And this was hard because for me, my family was my community. It was my first and most important community. I remember we would have our family reunions at one of our aunt's house and she had this big dining table that was made out of wood. We'd all be gathered around, my aunt, her husband, my parents, all my other aunts, uncle, all the cousins, and I'd be seated more like here, wanting to be part of that conversation and that family, but not quite knowing where my place was. I think part of it was temperament. I was a younger of two kids. Family legend has it that my brother was the easy kid. And 18 months later, unfortunately for my parents, they had me who was colicky, slept poorly, had strong opinions, and didn't easily comply. I was not winning the Child of the Year award anytime soon. We lived in the suburbs of New Jersey in an apartment complex, not anywhere near the woods. And yet, I'd come home from school, I'd spend my afternoons outside, there was no shortage of adventure for me. There were trees, a couple of crab apple trees, and I would start climbing up and see what I could find. Sometimes there would be a bird's nest. And sometimes I'd start digging. And as I was digging, I'd find broken pieces of plastic or rusty nails, sometimes some coins, maybe two quarters even. And for a child, this was my adventure. These were my treasures that I found. And I could spend all day, and that was my adventure. Eventually, I'd realize it's time to go home. It's dinner time. And as I got closer to my home, a feeling of dread would settle in my stomach. As I realized, as I opened that door, my mom would see me, and the look on her face would be one of disappointment when she saw the muddy knees on my white stockings or the hair ribbons that she had put so carefully that morning, long gone. And that was a contrast, the joy that I had just felt and that dread that I felt. It didn't help that there was a language barrier in our family. My parents grew up in Korea. They immigrated to the US when they were adults. My brother and I were two and four. It was a family of four, me, my older brother, two parents. And my parents asked us to speak Korean at home. And I could speak and understand enough Korean to follow along during dinners. But to actually speak a language, you need to really master it. And there was a level of mastery that I never quite got when, I, when it came to Korean. There's a whole spectrum of emotions, thoughts, opinions that I was never able to communicate to my parents. The other challenge was the cultural divide. My parents grew up in Korea during the Korean War. My dad was five, my mom was two. Although they've never talked about it, I suspect they've seen a lot of Poverty, violence, loss of life. Maybe that's why, but the values that they instilled in me and my brother was that about financial security. It meant a lot for them that we worked hard, went to a good school, and ended up in a big corporation earning a steady paycheck. I, on the other hand, grew up in this country reading Western novels, watching a lot of Hollywood films. So for me, the questions were always about, what should I be doing? What is my life meant to be? What would make me happy? Added to that, as a female, 
The key to financial stability involved marrying the right man. And for my parents, that was the right Korean man. Any Korean doctor. <laughs> I knew better, but I did go on to law school. And then I went on to a law firm in Washington, DC. My parents were so proud. I had finally reached this pinnacle of success as they had imagined it to be. They told their friends all about my new job, and it seemed like I had finally made my place in my family, and through that, the larger Korean family, the Korean community. But I eventually realized, and I had some health problems, and I, I realized that there was not enough joy or meaning in my job. And I also realized that this community that I thought I was a part of was actually not my community. It was my parents' community. It was their Korean immigrant community. And for me, who's grown up in this country for most of my life, my community is more American than it is Korean. And so I turned in my notice. I disappointed my parents. They were convinced that I was throwing my financial future away. But I knew that I needed to find my own path. And so through friends of friends, I came to know a woodworker who lives outside of DC. He was delighted that someone who was a lawyer would actually leave their job to work for him. He had a, he had a big order that summer. He was building kitchen cabinets for a high, high end home and he needed some help. And so I did a lot of sanding. It was never quite smooth enough. He said, keep sanding. <laughs> but that job was the best job for me at that time in my life. Because although I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life, I knew I wanted to work with my hands. And I knew I wanted to do something meaningful to me. And there was a lot of space during that summer to just think about where my life was going and to talk to my friend, Bob the Woodworker, because Bob was one of those people who actually followed his passion. He was a talented woodworker who played the mandolin, the banjo with his friends. He made his own instruments. And for him, this is just what you needed to do. You need to find your happiness, your joy. Bob also taught me the beauty of wood, how every piece of wood can have its own characteristic, its own personality and that you have to find the right way to carve it. You have to work with the wood. You can't work against it. And so I realized I wanted to take some woodworking classes, which I found in Vermont. I packed up my car. I drove up north. I left behind the communities that I had grown up with. And I moved up to Vermont without knowing what community I would find here. The first community that I found was through Cover Home Repair. Cover is a nonprofit that works on uh, bringing volunteers and homeowners together to fix homes to help homeowners live in their homes longer. Cover is located in White River Junction, which is about 20 minutes from here. I was first attracted to Cover because I wanted to learn more car carpentry and construction skills. But the reason I kept coming back were the lunches. The homeowner would prepare lunch if they could. And if they couldn't, they would sit with us and share lunch. We would be seated, volunteers, the homeowner, me. And over the course of lunch, I would find out that the volunteers that I had been working with in the morning were actually not as different as I had thought. Even though we came from such different walks of life, we still managed to find things in common. And finding those things in common felt like, to me, those buried coins that I would just discover as a child. They just brought me so much joy to find out how connected I was to another human being. I like to call this a community in training, because in my experience, through finding my 
communities that were meaningful and mattered to me. I needed three elements, and the first is to find an invitation, an invitation into the home that the homeowner has provided. And then there's a willingness on the part of the volunteer to spend eight hours of their day working on someone's house. And then there's the bravery, the courage, on the part of the volunteer to show up and on the part of the homeowner to ask for help. I don't expect that anyone, strangers who've just spent one day together, are going to be a community, which is why I think of it as a community in training. What it's showing me is that it's possible to create a sense of community out of differences. That people who we think may be different from us, if you put in the effort, you can perhaps create a deeper sense of community. Another example is um, potlucks. I'm guessing many of you have been to at least one potluck. When you're going to a potluck and you don't know many of the people yet, there's an invitation into that home by the host. And then you've thought about which dish to bring. You spent time making it, and then you bring it. You have the courage to show up without knowing if your dish is going to be popular at all, without knowing if no one will like it. There's that courage. And as I think about all the conversations and the dialogues happening in this country today, it feels like a lot of it is framed in terms of us versus them. It feels like things are divisive. I don't know if we're in a more divisive time than before. Perhaps we've always had this concept of us versus them. I know that it's natural for humans to think about us versus them. It helps us survive and protect our, our resources when we are in a group together. Just this morning, I had to lean on my friends, my parent friends, to take care of our daughter so that I could come here and protect my time, my resource of time. And so it makes sense to have an in-group. But what that could also lead to is hostility towards someone that we perceive as an outsider. I think for us to really grow as humans and to stretch, we need to be brave enough to invite others to our table we need to be brave enough to visit other tables. And so what I think this means is that the next time you're invited to a potluck, to say yes, to be brave enough to go. And as I reflect back on my life so far, I think about all the different ways it curved. And I took a road that was not straight it took a lot of detours, and I wasn't quite sure where I was going. But I realized that all those detours, the not knowing what I should be doing, the summer I spent working with my woodworker friend, the couple of years at my law firm learning law school's law legal skills, that they all landed me where I am today, which is leading that organization that I stepped into 17 years ago when I arrived in Vermont, I cover home repair as its executive director. Today I get to be a member of many communities that I've intentionally joined that feel profound and meaningful to me, that have made me stretch and grow as a human. And my communities today include the East Wheelock House community at Dartmouth College through my husband. It also includes my local Toastmasters Club, which is how I gained the confidence to be here today and two of the members who were in the audience some, somewhere. I also belong to a new community, which is a community of my fellow speakers who've been brave enough to share their stories with you today. Thank you.